You are listening to the Underground Voices Network. You will be hearing unfiltered truth from voices living the news. I remember about five or six years ago, I did some work with um, dissidents in Cuba. And I made wow. some films there, but I also did some training. We, we would help help people to, you know, understand the power of social media and use equipment, including trainings on how to use cell phones to capture video content, put together personal stories yeah. to uh, human human rights groups, but Cuban ones, you know, Cuban individuals who had started their own um, human rights groups and that were not obviously part of the government and they were sort of monitoring things and trying to get their stories out. And even though it was difficult for them to get it to other Cubans because things are banned there and blocked and everything, they could get it out to the international community. Right. Oh, you know, so-and-so was arrested today and it was, you know, it was out right away and people in Miami and, you know, LA and Madrid and all these different, in, in, into the diaspora and then, and then to the international media. And, you know, sometimes they would pick up on it. Um, but it was great because it was like, wow, this is straight from the people that we should be hearing from. And that's, yeah. that's what we want to do. We want to, we want to hear straight from people who are actually living it. So, and they, they don't have any agenda other than getting their story out there, you know, right? unfiltered. Yeah. Unfiltered. Right. And people can take it for what it's worth. And, and, uh, but you know, it's there, they're passionate about it. They're living it. So there's no, you know, it's, uh, it's hard to. It's hard to contradict it, you know, because it's it's not a, a news station that's that's maybe you know trying to push an agenda. Yeah. Well, tell us a little bit about your background. How did you get started? In because you make films and you make yeah uh, some of the stuff you were just talking about um, going down and educating people on how to use social media. That's very interesting. Yeah. So I I, um, I studied film and uh, did you go to school? Yeah, I, I went to University of Wisconsin. Um, it's where I, I was bo- actually born in England, and my family, um, my dad's always lived there, my sister lives there. My dad was a producer, mainly live events, music, a lot of music, and, and all over the world, and sports. Well, you don't have a British accent. I know, everybody's disappointed. <laughs> I came to the U.S. when I was five. Oh, okay. So, yeah, with, uh, my mom's American, my dad's uh, British. And, uh, you know, I was into in sort of current events, politics, international relations and philosophy in college. But then I got into film, too. And then I, you know, once I got past sort of only looking at fiction narratives and sort of looked at documentary filmmaking, that's where everything came together. Um, and living here now right outside Washington, D.C., too, for the last 15 years with my company and Alton Productions. It's been great because there are a lot of, you know, influential NGOs and and even you know the State Department and other things that are doing work um, on so many different topics yeah. uh, that are based here in D.C. Um, so it's been you know a great experience you know working in the Middle East and places like Cuba and, and Asia and uh, all over the world um, and for the last 15 years. I made a number of documentaries, but also shorter shorter form projects. We know now that. Uh, with social media, especially, I, I didn't know this 15 years ago when YouTube wasn't around. It was just starting out, I think, about a dozen or so. But um, that, yeah, you know, the short form videos were going to be kind of the, the place where it's at. I mean, there's still a place for documentaries, of course, but, you know, full length, feature length. But um, many, many docs, uh, things like that, that you can get out um, and, and people can watch anytime, any place uh, can also have an impact. And yeah. so. You know, doing sort of both of those ends, the, the shorter stuff and as well as the longer form form projects has been great. Well, I know a lot of people, me included, when I'm looking at videos on YouTube, I'm, I look one of the first things I look for is how long is this? And then <laughs> I look how much time do I have? So, right. yeah, I'm 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 with you. The, sometimes maybe the, the shorter thing right now is, is uh, oh, I can I can afford 10 minutes real quick or I can afford yeah. 15 minutes. I got 15 minutes. But right. I don't have an hour and a half. Oh, yeah. You know? Right. And if they do, maybe they'll go to for an event, you know, I mean, you know, with with, with your film. And, um, but, yeah, it's it's sort of like you, it forces you to be more concise and, and precise, too, with your storytelling, because you you might have sort of a, a, a deep story to tell that has a lot to it. But if you have two or three minutes, you know, if it's especially if it's on you know, Instagram and Twitter and things like that, that have these limits. Sort of like writing, not that 
people, a writer, my brother's a writer by trade. So he, you know, not that Twitter is, you know, really writing, but in a way it forces people to be concise and precise with, with their words. And um, there is a positive to that, to get yeah. their message out. So I feel like the same thing for visual storytellers as well. It's a challenge. So how many how many documentaries have you done, and can we find them anywhere? Can we watch? Yeah, them? Yeah, I think four or five. You know, sort of like longer form, and then a bunch of um, you know shorter shorter projects. Uh, my website is Inaltum Productions, so it's I N A L T U M Productions dot com, um, and it, it, yeah, I have all the links there. Like the last film that I that I produced uh, called Our Last Stand is on um, Amazon, so people can, can watch it there. Nice. And we have a new film coming out called Christians in the Mirror, uh, which we are going to start to screen in May and throughout the summer. I just finished it. Um, it, it focuses on persecution of Christians in five different countries, uh, Egypt, Iraq, Syria, uh, India, and uh, uh, Sudan. Well, see, we've, we've been hearing about Nigeria. That's, we're, we're getting yeah. ready to talk to somebody else in Nigeria. That's great. Hopefully, yeah, I mean, that's, hopefully this week or next week. Yeah, I mean, I, I was there in I think it was 2013. It was right when I mean, it, it was interesting. It was just by by uh, by chance that I was there meeting with refugees, mainly Christian refugees or or those who had converted or who come down from the north and were in sort of the center of the country and they were in refugee camps um, in Nigeria. And that was right when it was I think it was May 2013 when when the uh, Bring Back Our Girls yeah. sort of uh, movement, or maybe it was, yeah, it was May 2014, I believe. But, and it's, you know, it's interesting to look at that because that was like a moment when the world did get sort of behind this cause, even though that type of thing happens a lot there. And the girls were actually kidnapped, you know, I think a month or, or more before that. But once it sort of went viral, it got everybody's attention and a hashtag and yeah. And, and all that. And, you know, some, some people complain, well, you know, what are you doing if you just tweet about it or what are you doing? You know, what really happened to them? But I, I think every little bit helps, you know, like even yeah. a like on, a, on, you know, on a Facebook, that, that, it does something. Yeah. Uh, it doesn't mean that we shouldn't do more, but, you know, we shouldn't also say, well, we, we don't know the, the impact sometimes that we're going to have even right. something really small. We're all, we're all busy. We all have obligations. Um, and so even something small can go a long way to raise awareness. And so something like that, I think was, was a positive in that it got people to think outside of maybe learn something new, right. And be aware of it either consciously or not into the future. Now, what made you want to do a uh, humanitarian kind of documentaries? Um, I, I guess just, you know, studying international relations. And, um, I, I, I was, you know, my first sort of passion was, uh, you know, political prisoners and those working for democracy and human rights in, in Cuba. And I had a friend who was a priest from there and we were mountain climbing with a group in Mexico and, and we became friends and he came to visit me once from, uh, he was in Spain actually studying, but he's from Cuba. And he, you know, he, he, he spent a few days in DC, which was interesting. Um, uh, but he kind of said, well, why don't you make a documentary about what's going on in Cuba? And I, I just didn't know a lot, but I always knew that and what I'd heard maybe in college at the University of Wisconsin, where people tended to think positively of the Cuban government. And I, I just knew that that wasn't, you know, accurate. Well, because, was it risky? I mean, to be down there with a shooting a documentary and that because that that was right. not a, it's not a free place. Right. 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 Uh, yeah, it definitely was. I mean, I, I was there three times. Um, I didn't even and, know we could go down there. Well, yeah, you can go down there for, you can get a, a visa for, um, certain things. <laughs> uh, you can go down if you, if you're doing sort of humanitarian projects, I mean, there's two sides of it, you know, are you legal according to the Cuban government and are you legal according to the U S government? Really any American go down, American can, can go down there. Well, for the most part, you know, the Cuban government doesn't care. They want you there because the only way they're surviving is because of tourism. Okay. Uh, they used to have a sugar daddy, as I like to say, and that was the Soviet Union. And then th that sugar daddy passed away. And right. then their new one was Venezuela. All that oil money, they they don't have it anymore. And so yeah. really what's kept them afloat, Cuba, is tourists from Europe, South America, Canada, and some from the United States, even when it was illegal, because they, they would see an American passport and they would, just wouldn't stamp it. 
and says some because they they want the Americans to come. Right. And then when you as an American, you come back through like Cancun or wherever, uh, you know, they're, they're not going to know where you were. Um, and so a lot of Americans went down. There's a lot of uh, prostitution, but also like sex, you know, underage stuff going on. A lot of stuff here that would, you know, very um, I, I may have a lot of stories of things that I've, wow. that I've seen there that. Uh, um, and you covered a lot of that probably in your in your film, right? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, and so, you know, the problem, obviously, in Cuba is always it's been that way for 60 years now. Um, but I, I see some more positive things, even though there's a lot of, um, you know, there's death and destruction in Venezuela and Nicaragua. But I think maybe, you know, there's hope that that'll turn into something positive in the long term. And hopefully, you know, Cuba as well. I, I feel like there, we, we talk about the Arab Spring. I hope there's like a, a Cuban Spring, um, a, a tipping point, right. because I know that a majority of the people would like change there. Uh, it's just they don't feel like there's, you know, they're, they're safe enough to sort of, there's a tipping point where I think the majority of the, you know, the average people are going to sort of support change more vocally. Have you been back to Cuba since um, it's kind of changed over? change hands i i'm trying to remember. no the last time i was there well the last time i was there fidel castro was still alive but he you know he wasn't really in power um you know i, I have a lot of friends still there dr oscar Bissett is an individual who i made my documentary about he's he's won the presidential medal of freedom he's he came here to dc and met with you know paul ryan when he was speaker of the house and senator cruz and rubio who are big fans of his um, as, as Cuban Americans. And he and I talk quite a bit and I have other friends who are, who are still there and not much has really changed. Um, as far as, you know, the, the people in power are going to lose a lot if things change. And so whether they're true believers or not, I mean, I don't, I'm sure there are some who are true believers, but I think it's more about just keeping power and, and what could happen to them if change takes place, because then they're going to be held to account. And so, you know, whether it's Raul Castro or, you know, all the others that are going to follow the Castros, uh, they, they don't have much of a motivation to to change right now, especially when the international community doesn't put a lot of pressure on them. Tell us about another country that you've done a film in that um, really has had a big impact on you. Um, I'm sure they all have. But I mean, is there yeah. one that's just really in your mind all the time still? Well, you know, Iraq and Syria are, are yeah. really interesting. I, 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 you know, I make this kind of comparison uh, with a place like Cuba because I always talk about Cuba. I, I really feel like if there's two types of governments that could really exist there, and that's what, what they have currently, or some sort of democracy. It might not be what we have in the United States. It might not be... Um, you know, even an ideal, it might take a while to get, you know, a, a bit, uh, you, you know, what, whatever the ideal of democracy is. But I, I feel like those are the two types of governments that would exist. Um, but in a place like Syria, it's so much more complicated. And I think it's difficult for Americans to to understand only that because I, 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 I know I've gone through that process and I'm not an expert on Syria. But when you look at it, you say, wow, there's so many things going on. There's so much history, there's so many different groups. And so, you know, people can say, well, okay, you have Assad and you have groups like Al-Qaeda or Al-Nusra and ISIS and you have the Kurds, you have Syriac Christians and you have, um, the, you know, Shia and Sunni and, and uh, you know, and then their relationship, will, you know, with, with Iran and with Iraq and Lebanon. And it, you it's know, very it's complicated. Just, it's very, it's like a, a game of chess compared to, I think, the West or at least North and South America, which can be complicated too, but, um, you know, it's just it's very difficult for for groups to exist there because they have to make so many different alliances uh, with with other groups that they normally wouldn't um, sort of common enemies. Uh, and so it, it is fascinating to get into it. But then you realize why there is so much, um, you know, there are so many problems and so many struggles there because there are so many competing groups. But but Syria, I mean, I've been there four times in the last five years. Wow. Uh, three times up more, more in the northeast. And uh, once in Aleppo and Damascus coming from Lebanon. And the last time I was there was in December. And this is right before we met with 
some of the SDF, uh, Syrian Democratic Forces, who just this past weekend um, officially, I think, <laughs> defeated ISIS uh, in in eastern Syria. Yeah. And their spokesman actually was featured in uh, our last our last stand. Uh, and he's actually a Syria Christian. So when people which kind of gets me frustrated sometimes because they always say, oh, the Kurdish forces, the Kurdish forces, which there are a lot of Kurds, majority Kurdish forces fighting ISIS, but there are a lot of Syriac Christians too, including the spokesman for the group. And uh, and so it's a diverse group, also some um, uh, Sunni Arabs groups too, which and they're all different ethnically and religiously. They're different, Kurds and, and um, Syriacs. And, and, and Sunni Muslims are different. Uh, and um, unfortunately, the media doesn't usually report it that way. But that's an example of one group, the SDF, that has done a lot of good, I think, of coming together to, despite their differences to fight off a group that I think everybody can agree uh, needed to be defeated in ISIS. So, From your perspective, from all you've seen and been around, what is your perspective on um, uh, worldwide persecution and religious strife and things like that yeah that's a good i i feel like just generally uh, you know we're talking about social media sometimes people have uh the tendency to sort of say wow you know i it's i can't believe how much evil there is in the world and and or you know i wouldn't want to raise a child in a world like this and i i don't know if i think it's better now than at most times it's just we know more right I mean, there are big areas of, 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 I mean, look at Europe and even like with like Brexit or you, they're, they're arguing, they're debating these things, not militarily. And that's a good thing. If we're not, if we're at each other's throats, but not literally, right. that's a step forward because that usually might equals right. And that still is obviously it does come to, you know, uh, you know, physical military conflict sometimes, but when we're debating ideas and we're especially when it's a democracy, um, I think that's a positive step. Uh, but, I, you know, a lot of places are not free and, and don't experience religious freedom. And so, you know, back to your point, I, I don't think there's as much focus on religious freedom as there needs to be, especially in the West. And, you know, this is obviously despite, you know, this is regardless of a person's religion. Uh, this is something that I think the United States needs to take more of a leading role on, has has more recently. But a lot of times there are people in, in the State Department and, and other places that, in, especially the media, who just don't, they can't fathom the idea that religion even is important to anybody because right. it's not important to yeah. them. This is, again, it doesn't matter if it's Islam or Christianity, it doesn't matter what religion. And, and so they're confused by it. Right. And it, it's like, no, 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 this is really important to certain people. And so we need to promote religious freedom. It's going to help everybody. Um, and we need to be consistent on it, no matter if it's in Europe or Africa or Middle East, because that's a, a value that we should uphold. Um, well, do you so, think it, do you think just because it's a, it's been the way of America that we just take that for granted? Most people just take that for granted and just think that everybody kind of has that right except for maybe the middle east because we do hear yeah. about all the religious fighting that goes on there but because we've just as americans we just or the west we've always had you know religious freedom right i think that's a good point i think we don't know or i think another assumption is that certain places are are well everybody is that religion right so we might look at the Middle East and say, you know, the, the Muslim part of the world, I think like certain, you know, I think oh, President Obama even said that. And it's like, well, wait a second. There's a lot of there's a lot of, you know, other religions there. And just like here, if we right. said, you know, it is dominant, you know, the predominant religion in the West is, is Christianity, but that, that we still recognize other religions and, and, and you know, want to promote religious freedom for everybody. Right. Um, so I think there is like, especially amongst the the sort of general population, the assumption that, well, if you go to the Middle East, it's all Muslims. If you go to, you know, you know, Asia, it's, you know, if you go to India, it's all Hindus. If you go to certain parts of Asia, it's going to be, if, you know, it's going to be Buddhism or maybe, you know, other religions. And there might be some other people mixed in here and there, but understanding the history of, um, of these areas and understanding, well, oh, okay, I didn't know that, you know, Christianity was around in Iraq and Syria before even Islam, and there's still, you know, five to ten percent of the population is still that way. That's interesting. 
yeah. um, or in Africa too, where I look at, you know, there are tribal religions, but also the Christians and, and Muslims predominantly, those two um, in each country is a little bit different. And, uh, or yeah, so it's, it's, yeah, I mean, it is about education, but then just, I think raising up religious freedom as something that we need to, to promote. And that includes, of course, just freedom of conscience, which means, Hey, if you don't believe in anything, um, that's okay too. Like that's a, it's, that's, you know, something we need to protect as well. Um, because oftentimes I think religion can become almost like it, it becomes a tribe, uh, and, you know, combined with ethnicity and other things, uh, and that can sometimes get a bit dangerous. Well, how do you stay motivated when, uh, the news and, and, and the media in general, uh, doesn't seem to have, you know, as much interest in these kind of topics, especially the ones that you, that you, that you, you are passionate about and you're making okay. films about how, how do you stay motivated? Um, well, I think twofold first, you know, when you do talk to somebody and, uh, or you, you have a screening, let's say in, the, in, in, in somewhere that is, you might not expect a lot of people to be interested in a, a specific topic and they're not from the, the diaspora of that group. Right. So I, I've done that before where, there might be 300 people at a big screening and I ask people to raise their hand if they're, you know, from a certain, you know, that ethnic background. And then I and I thank them for being there. And then I ask people who are not from that background to raise their hand. And I say, I thank you even more because yeah. it's important if you're not Cuban, even I'm talking about now, you know, just nationality, but to to care about what's going on. You can even have more of an impact. And so right. it's it's nice to see other people who who are, who have no connection, who might not know a lot and they're secure enough in, as I, you know, have, I'm very ignorant on a lot of issues to say, you know, I'm going to go, this looks interesting. I'm going to go watch a film or I'm going to try to learn a little bit more about a situation, um, you know, and then have a conversation with others about it. So that, that's encouraging. And then also just, you know, getting to the chance to meet with and continuing to have friendships with people on the ground uh, who <clears throat> are experiencing those things. And well, that's you know, my next question was going to be how how is your support system inside these countries you work in and in, and people you have around you here in the states? Very very good. Yeah, I mean, I think um, you know people on the ground they're they're, they're very eager to get their story out, and uh, you know that. <laughs> well, speaking of you know the first, well the second time I went to Syria with um, this young man, Kino Gabriel was who's uh, the spokesman now for SDF. And he was at that point, the spokesman just for the, the Christian part of it. But, you know, and we, he spent three days with me and, and Helma, who's uh, the feature, you know, uh, subject in, the, in our last stand. And, you know, people would ask me, well, you know, how do you get these contacts and how do you, you know, how can he spend this much time with you and just show you around? And I said, well, I wish he, he told, you know, I, I asked him, oh, can you, can you spend time with us? And I wish he would have told me, I don't know, I got CNN, I got, you know, I got the Associated Press, I got the BBC coming in, they're doing all these stories. Unfortunately, they're not. And so, you know, they'll take an independent documentary filmmaker, um, they'll take any press they can get. And so right. uh, it's the same way that, if, you know, if a group in the U.S. reaches out via via the Internet to, to groups, you know, across the world who are doing good things and say, hey, we want to support you spiritually, we want to support you monetarily or whatever it is, I, they're going to be eager because um, I think just that solidarity means a lot, right. you know, just, just the act of, of, of reaching out, even if nothing comes of it, obviously you want, you know, somebody to back it up. But, um, and so in a way that, that kind of means your impact can be that much more, it kind of multiplies because there isn't a lot of positive things that people are doing that the little bit that you can do that you, then it kind of means more. Um, and so, yeah, there, to see the impact, I think, on them, just on a personal basis, it goes a long way. Well, give our audience some sort of an idea of, of uh, maybe two or three stories of sufferings and things that you've witnessed or when you're, when you're abroad in all these countries. And, and I, 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 even my trips in Iraq, I mean, when I saw 10 people living in a 10 by 10 tent with everything they owned in the world, in it you yeah. know or i saw in the middle of winter a lady in a tub of water just trying to wash some dishes and in a mud 
tent all around and I've seen them with brooms still trying to take pride in their tents, you know, and clean around, you know. Yeah. What, give us a couple of stories of things that you've witnessed that that absolutely that, that m- most people may not even think about. Yeah, two or three that come to mind that of, of individuals that have really inspired me, and you know, the list is sort of, you know, I'm you know, really long. But Dr. Bissett, I mentioned him, Dr. Oscar Bissett, and um, he was sentenced to 25 years in prison. Well, he's sentenced to three years in prison for. You know, publicly, he's, he's a medical doctor. He was protesting, you know, publicly, nonviolently, a big sort of um, believer in the philosophy of Martin Luther King Jr. And, and Gandhi and things like that. But just protesting for political prisoners and, and for democracy. And um, and he was sentenced to three years up in prison. He got out. This is in, this is 15 years ago. He was out for a month and then they rearrested him and put uh. him in, sentenced him to 25 years. Um Wow. And uh, uh, but I remember, you know, he had been in for about 10 or 11 years at that for that sentence. And it, I think it was about 2010 or something. And uh, the Catholic Church in Cuba and the Spanish government were sort of negotiating that about 75 political prisoners would be released. Um, and, you know, the Cuban government said, well, that's OK, we'll, we're going to release them, but they have to forced into exile, like they, they have to leave and never come back. And Dr. Bissett, he, he, re, he said, no, he refused. He said, I'd rather stay in prison, um, you know, in, wow. in his country. He, he doesn't want to leave. And he, he's, come, he's had the opportunity to travel a couple of times, and he has taken it, but only knowing that he can return. And he still lives in, in Havana and, and, you know, experiences a lot of— But they let him out of prison. They they eventually did. I'm sorry. Yeah, I skipped ahead. Yeah, they eventually did, even though he said, no, I won't leave. And so they released the others and they kept him in there. And then I think it was a couple months later, they actually did release him. Wow. Wow. Um, and, you know, they're they're keeping their eye on him, obviously. And he's continuing continuing with new projects. But it just showed me like the dedication because he, he had a very difficult in prison, as you, you know, as you can imagine, in, in a place like Cuba, um, where there's a lot of torture and a lot of. Th- things that I, I don't even know about that I'm sure affected him and many others. So uh, I'm afraid know. to speak out sometimes, <laughs> Jordan, to people just because it, they just because maybe they'll just not like me anymore. <laughs> I can't imagine yeah, exactly. what these guys go through, and and uh, so I, it's easy to understand why he's uh, a big influence to you. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, a couple of years ago, I think a lot of people know the story of the the 21 Coptic Christians who yeah. were. Uh, beheaded by ISIS in Libya, and they were yeah. they were working in Libya, but they're from a small town in in um, rural Egypt. And uh, I, I went there to, to document um, their story and talk to some of the children and the wives of of those in, th- of those men. And it, it was very it was a really interesting time. I mean, even though they had experienced so much suffering, they they had a lot of a very deep faith. And they, they saw it as as sort of their mission and their calling in life to to be a, sort of a spokesman for for, you know, their their sons or their their brothers or, or husbands. And so, you know, I went there kind of having this mindset of, well, this is going to be a very, um, a very sad and tragic story. And it was. But there is also a very uh, inspiring and hopeful side to it. And it really rejuvenated me. And every time when I was editing and now I watch the film and it's going to come out soon, it's, you know, you get to watch it a million times and, and know, oh, yeah. <laughs> know every little facial expression. And and uh, it, it's just beautiful, some of the things that they said and the way that they said it. And, I, you know, I'm just like, wow, people need to see it because it, it shows how important religion is, how, how important faith is, how important believing in something bigger than yourself yeah. is. And it, it was a gift to me to be able to, to be there and experience it and then bring their message he, over here. Um, so, yeah, those are, I don't know if there's time, but quickly, Reverend John in South Sudan, he was a former lost boy of South Sudan, and when he was a, much younger, obviously, and he eventually became um, a uh, Anglican priest. Uh, he's married, has a, a number of children, and he started a school for, for refugee ch- children of refugees in South Sudan, and I was able to go there, uh, and they have a uh, few hundred um, good shepherds, the Good Shepherd Academy in South Sudan, outside Juba, 
400 kids and they, you know, they don't have a lot as far as resources go, you know, not barely, you know, running water, things like that. But they, he has such a heart, he and his wife and, and the school there and the academy um, for, for helping their, you know, South Sudan is the newest country in the world, which I don't even know, didn't know that before going there. Uh, and so they're looking ahead to kind of build leaders for South Sudan, but starting it is with, the newest country in the world. Yeah. Yeah, it is. It's, it's been around eight years, seven, seven, eight years. I, I didn't know that. So when people say, oh, well, I don't know a lot about an area. I said, look, I was, you know, I didn't even know that till I was almost on the plane there that it was the newest country. And, you know, I'm always, you know, I'm researching on the way there because I'm traveling around 10, 15 countries a year. And, and, uh, and so, yeah, it was, it was, but it was, it was fun to learn the history through his story um, have you grown up in, in Sudan, but he has, a, he has a, he has a connection. He went to seminary in, outside Pittsburgh, you know, so it, it makes it a small world. Um, yeah. somebody like that, who's just tireless in their efforts, uh, it really inspires you. And, and so, uh, I want to get others to see it cause I know they're going to be inspired too, to see right. his story. Right. What would you like the general public? What's one thing you'd like the general public to know? Well, your, I would say what's your main uh, well, uh, yeah, thing you yeah, want to get I, out. I would say quickly, there's two things. One would be that this is more sort of like, I don't want to say political, but people looking at, you know, you mentioned earlier that we have a certain mindset in this country where we're, we're, we're trying to be um, fair. We don't always live up to that. You know, we have certain principles, uh, you know, about equity and about freedom for different different groups and, and, you know, uh, you know, religions or, or people that think a certain way. Um, and not many people would say that they don't believe in that, even if they, we don't always act in, in, in that way, but it, the rest of the world isn't, or a lot, a lot of places in the world isn't like that there, you know, so we have to remember that. So if, if, um, a lot of times with regards to like Christians in the middle East, or if, you know, could be Kurds, any group, uh, we kind of dismiss it, right? But we have to understand that they could be living in an area or in a country that doesn't, they don't have any say about what their, you know, what their rights are, about what, you know, what resources they get. And I always give the analogy of like, or the, I, I tell people, look, if you're, if you're a Christian and you're in Mosul, um, which, you know, isn't in the Kurdish area, it's right, right south of it. And or right outside Mosul and ISIS is coming in, right? Summer 2014. You know, you, you look to the north, you have the Kurdish area, which is where they went. But people are a bit more tribal. You know, you got to look out for your group first. You look to, to one side, you see Syria. You look to the other, you got Iran. You look to the south, you got Saudi Arabia. Nobody's there to help you. And so and Tur Turkey's right up there, too. Yeah, and Turkey's right there. Yeah, and That's where they came from. <laughs> A lot of the Christians came down from Turkey. You know, they were they were uh, a part of the uh, Armenian genocide. They were, you know, a lot of uh, Assyrians, and Chaldeans, and Syriacs were killed then too. That's a terrible um, story. And so they kind of look to the West and say, "Well, the West, you know, they they're kind of Christian, or they they might, you know, they care about everybody. So maybe they'll care about you know some of the minority groups, whether it's the Kurds, whether it's the Christians, others. Um, and the West is sort of like, they, no, we we don't care about about you." Um, because we don't want to look like we're helping one group over another. And so we're going to disproportionately not help you. Right. And, and so they feel very let down because, uh, mm. because their countries or wherever they live, they are on, you know, sort of the, the bottom, like the, like the Yazidi too. Um, but I think, uh, wonderful people. Yeah, exactly. And they've, they've experienced the worst of it. We, we interviewed one Yazidi girl who was abducted. I know you guys, you know, that, that was a big focus of, the, of your film. Um, and then, you know, people at least are starting to hear, they, they, you know, when you say you see, you're like, okay, I've heard of that group. Um, and so there's some positive momentum to come out of such a tragedy. But we have to remember that it is very tribal. And, and so, yeah, we can say, well, okay, Iraq has elections now. But it's really, again, might equals right. Majority is going to take over. Right. Hopefully long term it'll change. But we have to remember that, you know, when we, even if we send resources to a government or, or provide security, that the minorities are, you know, you know, sometimes minorities here in the U.S. aren't treated, you know, as fairly as maybe they should be. But in other places, it's a lot worse. And it's just expected that, that whoever is in power and whoever has a majority is going to dominate. 
Right. And that's the way most of human history has gone. And that's the way a lot of countries still run. So we have to have that mindset, um, you know, with regards to, I think, our our foreign policy as well. And just, you know, the way that we try to spread awareness. Um, and, and quickly, the last thing is just, you know, we, we've touched on this before, but even little things can help with solidarity. So reaching out to different groups. One thing I, I tell people to do is like reach out on, on you know, let's use social media for like positive things, not all hate, <laughs> not yeah, all just exactly. diatribes and, um, yeah. you know, and so reaching out to different, you can reach out to to like the people that I document, they have Facebook pages, you know, they have the, the groups have websites for the most part, not everybody, but even just to reach out and say, you know what, you know, I, I saw a story about you or I'm thinking about you, I'm praying for you, whatever. That's not an obligation that you have to do anything, but they're they're going to really appreciate the solidarity yeah. involved there. And also with and so many just Jasper groups that live in your in your in your neighborhood too. go to the, the you know, Syriac Orthodox Church and right around the corner and say, you know what, come come talk to our church or come you know, talk to our community group. We want to learn more about what you've experienced because it's a small world. They're right around the corner. So don't, you know, don't forget that. You know, that, that's such a good point too, because we, the Bible even tells us to build each other up and, and uh, edify each other. So, you know, I know that just reaching out and encouraging, I, I still do. I have some friends in Iraq and I'll still just reach out to them sometimes and try yeah. to get caught up with them and, and I do think about them every day. I mean, you know, I've yeah. got posters on the wall. I got camera, my old cameras that I used in that film. I don't use them anymore, and but I won't get rid of them. You know, I've got them sitting over here yeah. where I see them every day. And and uh, so it, it's it's. I mean, if I like to, I like it when somebody calls me sometimes and encourages me about something. So it's. I'm glad you said that. But, I think I'm going to have to uh, get a little bit better about that myself, reaching yeah. out to people. Because it, I, I never thought about what you just said, reaching out to people you, maybe you have never have met, and you just see a post or something and just reach out and say, say yeah. hey, I heard you, heard about your story and praying for you. I like that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, praying for I'm going I'm to show a couple other people about it, and who knows what kind of impact it's going to have. Well, I mean, wouldn't you want somebody doing that for you if if it was reversed? Yes. Yeah. I, quickly, and I, I know you don't have a lot of time, but I, I remember hearing about this when a, a political person who wasn't well known in Cuba, and he was in the middle of the island, sentenced to twenty twenty five years, and he's even thinking about suicide. Wow. But somebody had somehow transmitted to him, like through his wife, who came to visit him once every six weeks for two hours or whatever they get, that 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 on the internet somebody had heard his story, and they had you know, started a, a, you know, a Facebook page for him or something sort of obscure, like not a lot of people, but that gave him so much hope and that, that what he was doing was known. His sacrifice was known. There was hope that, you know, maybe something positive would happen. But even if he, even if he finished his life there, that there's that solidarity um, that was out there. And so something small like that can go a long way, a lot longer than we sometimes realize. Besides encouraging maybe some brothers and sisters out there, how else can we help in the humanitarian with with humanitarian? How do we know where to start? A lot of times, yeah. You know, there's I know that there's thousands probably NGOs and humanitarian yeah. efforts, and we even had somebody reach out to us and and say, uh, "Well, how do I know that if I donate that it it's going to get to where it needs to be?" and so what have you found? And and please, if you'll send me links uh, sure. when we're done, I'll I'll post these. You know, if if you know of some humanitarian groups that you trust and that you've worked with before, so maybe just give us some advice that way. Yeah, there there are a lot of a lot of groups um, out there that I think if you you know if somebody knows somebody um, who's done their research, their due diligence, then there are a lot of good groups that um, are very sort of accountable and efficient with their money. And, and you can check on, you know, you know, they're very, they're very diligent that way um, to make sure that it's going in the right place. And uh, so that's one, you know, as far as resources go, but, you know, a lot of places will say, look, we not to discount, I mean, money and things are important. Um, 
you know, putting putting pressure on even our elected officials, you know, even though that's I mean, maybe that's more of a D.C. mindset, which I don't like. But it, we assume that like a, a congressman, a congresswoman, they, they know what's going on in every part of the world. And and I don't I don't you know, it, it's a tough job. They have to know about everything. And they're focused on they usually have a different career, obviously, that they came out of. And they're focused on getting reelected. Do and they really the, hear what we have to say, though? Does it really get to them? I think I'm I'm I think you'd be surprised because um, not that many people approach them on these foreign uh, um, on these international issues, foreign policy issues. And so if they hear from a few people in their district, for example, I'm just talking about a member of Congress about an issue. First of all, it might cause them or more importantly, their staff <laughs> to do a bit of research. Right. On it, and so um, all of a sudden, it can become sort of an issue that they they can champion, and I've seen it a lot. Um, so I, I wouldn't I wouldn't discount how much because I've seen it many many times how much um, influence even just one person or a small group of people who are into it, you know, one area of the world and say, okay, I, we need to get the word out. Why 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 aren't we? You can actually educate your elected officials on these issues. Um, yeah. so that's, that's one thing. And then, you know, again, like we were talking about, uh, I, I do, I, you know, I ask people, you know, at a church, for example, maybe have the pastor, the priest say, okay, we're going to pray for, this takes, you know, 10 seconds. Hey, we're going to pray for, you know, the, the situation and blah, blah, blah. Right. Not only in 10 seconds, you're not only praying, you know, the spiritual solidarity, but also you're educating people. A lot of people might say, well, what? Where is that and what's going on there? And maybe the the priest or pastor might explain it, but it, some people might go home and actually do some research. And so you're also creating awareness as well as a spiritual solidarity. And who knows where that's going to lead to, but that's something really, really small that you can do with, you know, five, 10, 15 seconds of, of, a, of a day. Right. Um, yeah. To kind of, because you got to think long-term about, you know, the next generation and how educated they're going to be and how much they're going to care about these issues and just know what's going on in the world and follow it. Um, and so, yeah, I think, you know, thinking long-term planning long-term is, is important in an ever sort of shrinking world that we live in. Jordan, thank you so much. It's been very, um, educational and enjoyable to yeah. to catch up with you and meet you for for, for the first time in person kind of <laughs> in person yeah hey this is yeah this is great now, yeah thank you when you're when your um new project comes out if i mean if you'd love to we would love to talk to you about it if you want to Absolutely. Tell us about it and we'll get it out there we'll we'll spread it out to all of our social media outlets and and that, uh, that'd be fantastic. Christians in the mirror.com. It's still, the website is up, but you know, we're still, I mean, we have a, a Facebook page, you know, from these different places and a lot of inspiring, difficult stories, but, um, yeah, it's kind of a unique project. Did so. you say Christians? What Sorry, Christians in the mirror. Dot yeah. com. Dot com. Yep. And on okay. Facebook is Christians in the mirror. Instagram. And it's too. supposed to be showing next month or in May. Yes, we're, we're going to do a couple of DC screenings, hopefully one on Capitol Hill, which is good, and then another one. And then from there, we're going to, um, that's sort of like the next kickoff. Uh, so early May and then throughout the summer and fall and, and um, you know, try to get it out there as, as much as possible. All right. Well, thanks, Jordan. Thank you. Thanks, Jimmy. I appreciate it. Yeah.